Okay, so let's start at the top here. Uh, you, you wrote the book Proteinaholic to describe the protein-centric way of eating, which places protein-rich foods at the center of all meals and as the sort of prized macronutrient. So in your words, can you basically tell us what exactly is a proteinaholic? What's a proteinaholic? An American? Um, you know, I, a proteinaholic is someone who, despite getting more than enough protein, thinks that they need more protein and is constantly thinking about where to get protein with every meal. And in fact, and I see this all the time in patients that come to see me, they're eating eggs and bacon for breakfast. They're eating, you know, a chicken sandwich for lunch. They're eating chicken for dinner. And then they're supplementing with protein shakes, which is ridiculous. And so that's a proteinaholic. It's someone who's constantly thinking I need more protein. And in fact, a, a study that I mentioned in the book looked at it and about 65 to 70% of buyers of food shoppers are saying to themselves, where can I get more protein? Even though no one's getting too little protein. So before you became a plant-based diet advocate, you considered yourself a proteinaholic. So no. can you tell us a little bit about your story and your transition? Yeah, you know, so... All my life, I kind of wanted to get muscular and big, and so I was constantly downing protein shakes. And I wasn't getting muscular and big because just drinking protein shakes isn't going to do it, but I thought it would. Um, you know, you never learn much about nutrition in medical school. I, I would say doctors had a very late person's knowledge. You know, uh, we would tell people to do Atkins, or we would tell them to do Zone Diet because we didn't know any better, so we just told them the you know typical layperson diets. Um, you know, I went to medical school, I went to residency, never heard about um, nutrition. And then I went and I started a practice dealing with obesity. And I still didn't hear about nutrition. I would go to conferences where we would talk about for a week about obesity without mentioning food, which is an insane concept, but it wasn't insane to me at the time. It was, that's Western medicine. That's what I did. I did, I fixed you with my hands, not with the food and the food was an afterthought. So, so I, I became an obesity surgeon and I wrote a book called Experts Guide to Weight Loss Surgery, where I told people to eat protein first. And all my patients are coming to me. They've all done Atkins a million times. Like there was a ridiculous New York Times article uh, that said before people do weight loss surgery, they should first do a low carb diet. Every single one of my patients has done low carb diets multiple times. It's the go-to diet. It has been for many years and they're all still coming to see me. And yet I told them to eat a high protein, low carb diet. And I myself was doing that. And then um, I had uh, my children and I went to get a life insurance policy test and I failed the test. You know, my, I had hypertension, I had high cholesterol, and I kind of stopped and said, wait a second, this is, this is crazy. I'm supposed to be a doctor telling people how to live healthy. And yet here I am unhealthy at 35 years old. There's got to be something wrong. And I started really looking at the research and actually looking at diet. And the interesting thing I found is we eat more protein than any other country in the world. I ate protein by the tons all day long, protein shakes, steaks, eggs, and where was it getting us? We're the most overweight country in the world. We have the highest cholesterol levels. We have the highest heart disease, highest diabetes, you name it. And so I started looking at this kind of critically and look back at the RDA studies, which show that, you know, the typical male needs 56 grams of protein, typical female needs 46, and yet we're eating 100, 120 grams. And even when we're getting that much, we want more. And that's when I started getting this concept that we're so, and, and like, I see it every day, you know, the patients come in and they're eating tons and tons of protein. And I say to them, well, why do you think you're gaining weight? And they say, it's the carbs. And I'm like, wait a second, there was no carbs in your diet. It was all protein. <laughs> and, you know, and they're like, oh, well, yeah, I guess. But, uh, you know, they, my doctor told me to eat protein, so I'm eating protein. And then I put them on a diet and I tell them to eat an apple for a snack. And, you know, I get their diet log back the next week. There's no apples. So why did you eat at this point a beef jerky stick instead of an apple? It's like, well, because it had protein. And it's just, oh my God, this word protein has become so etched in people's brains and it's a huge marketing scheme. I mean, it, there was a Great Wall Street Journal article on this that if something says protein on it, people want to buy it. Like if, if I put protein on the label, you're going to want it. And that's what a protein all like is. Okay, so this is actually really interesting because, you know, there's so many speakers in our, in our summit that are sort of reiterating the same philosophy here, which is that 
protein is not the answer and fat is not the answer. Uh, and that, you know, eating a diet that's higher in its carbohydrate content is actually a much more effective way of eating for long-term health, especially for reversing diabetes. So let's, where did this protein centric philosophy come from in the first place? And why is it so ingrained in the way that we think? Right. Well, you know, there's many things that make it ingrained. Um, it started a long time ago in the 1800s. Um, there was a professor who was looking at muscle tissue and skin and things like that. And they found that in fact, everything is made of protein. And so they figured to themselves, well, if everything is made of protein, we must need to eat protein. And they did this study where they were looking at workers on the Empire State Building, uh, and they were looking at what they ate in a day, and they were eating high protein. And so they said, okay, well, they're eating high protein. We must all need high protein, which is you know not a very good study. But that kind of started it. Then you start looking at things like the Atkins diet, which became really big. The thing about the Atkins diet is it, it, it will work, and it will work for several reasons. First of all, you lose weight because you lose water weight. And second of all, you go into ketosis. You go into ketosis, you're not as hungry. You don't eat as much, you're going to lose some weight. You also lose muscle, which we know now, even though people think you eat protein and it doesn't make you lose muscle, but going into ketosis will make you lose muscle. Your sugars will go down with it. Your body will start utilizing fat. You're not eating carbs, so your blood sugar is not going down. And the problem is we've made diabetes into what is your blood sugar at any given time. But the disease process is not what your blood sugar is, at least in type 2 diabetes. The disease process is that your body isn't sensitive to insulin in type 2 diabetes. That's the disease process. The effect, the symptom, is the high sugar. And so everybody focuses on the sugar without realizing there's a disease process here. So you could cut all the sugar out of your diet, you can make that symptom level go down, but you're not fixing the central core issue, which is the insulin resistance. The insulin resistance is the true problem. And so that's why we see people who get their blood sugar under control and yet still get the side effects of diabetes. And there's been a lot of studies now that tight control of, of type 2 diabetes doesn't seem to lead to a decrease in the complications of diabetes. And that's because we're, the tight control of diabetes is tightly controlling the sugar, but that's not the disease process. So many people believe that dairy is a great source of high quality protein. How do we know that this is not the truth? I mean, there's been a lot of studies on this and it's, I tell you, it's very hard to look at studies because dairy industry puts a lot of money into making you confused and they spend a lot of money on this. And, and, um, uh, Dr. Michael Greger actually exposed this in one of his videos where he actually had the, agenda from a meeting they had where they started talking about how they need to enter into confusion and doubt as part of their marketing. And so there, I, there's so every time I see, I, I put an article in my book where they looked at dairy and they looked at a whole bunch of studies from dairy. Now, if the studies were funded by dairy, a hundred percent of them said dairy was good for you. If they were funded by dairy, if they weren't funded by dairy, I think it was only 36% showed it was good for you. So, you know, there's a huge difference based on what the funding is for the studies. And, uh, and so you got to watch out for that, but you got to understand a few things about dairy. It, most dairies are high in fat. We know from certain studies that as soon as you eat dairy, you get, an inflammatory response in your body. They did a great study where they fed people orange juice, water, or dairy. Again, this is in the book. And there was, you know, orange juice. Everybody says sugar causes inflammation. It doesn't. Um, you eat sugar, there's no change in the inflammatory mediators in the body that we can measure. You give them water, obviously no effect. You give them cream, right away it shoots up. Now, why is that? We think it has to do with um, what's called endotoxins. Um, so you could pasteurize the milk and kill all the bacteria, but an endotoxin is a toxin that's in the bacteria. You might kill the bacteria, but that toxin's still in there and it gets absorbed by the body and it creates an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response is a big part of a disease process. Um, we also know that, you know, milk is relatively high in protein. It stimulates IGF-1. There was a great study recently showing an increased risk of prostate cancer. Um, thought to be because of this uh, increased risk of uh, because of this increase of this hormone IGF 
one when you eat milk. Another really good Swedish study that showed women, the more milk they ate, the higher their risk of premature death. So there's been some really good long-term studies with it. There's been good short-term studies showing uh, increase in inflammation and problems with the way your blood vessel constricts and re relaxes. Um, and uh, there's nothing in milk that you can't get um, from plant-based alternatives.